4. American Protective League The understaffed nature of the federal intelligence institutions and mounting fears of internal subversion, disloyalty, and espionage conspiracies among the American public during the World War prompted an extraordinary development in intelligence practices. The cultivation of a private organization to provide supplementary assistance to government agencies having responsible for the detection, surveillance, and capture of individuals thought to be a threat to the nation's security. Just before the eruption of hostilities in Europe, the Bureau of Investigation had fostered an informer network and efforts to combat white slave traffic. Quote, In 1912, Bureau Chief A. Bruce Bialski directed his agents to ask waiters, socialites, and members of various organizations to eavesdrop on private conversations and to forward tips to bureau offices if their suspicions were aroused. Many prosecutions had resulted from these tips, from using volunteers against organized vice to using them against conspiracy to commit espionage and sabotage was an easy transition, end quote. What made the espionage sabotage detection arrangement unique was its private organization character. It functioned as an institution in parallel to the federal intelligence agencies. Called the American Protective League, the group was a product of the efforts of Chicago advertising executive Albert M. Briggs and two other wealthy businessmen, Victor Elting and Charles D. Fry. Footnote. For the authorized but unreliable history of the League, see Emerson Hoff, The Web, Chicago, The Riley and Lee Company, 1919. End footnote. In late 1916, Briggs became concerned about the inadequate strength and equipment of the Bureau of Investigation and subsequently urged Bureau Chief Belaski and Attorney General Thomas W. Gregory to establish an auxiliary force to assist in pursuing security risks. As presented to the Justice Department, Briggs's proposal gave the following details. Quote, its purpose, a volunteer organization to aid the Bureau of Investigation of the Department of Justice. The object, to work with and under the direction of the Chief of the Bureau of Investigation of the Department of Justice or such attorney or persons as he may direct, rendering such service as may be required from time to time. Membership. This organization is to be composed of citizens of good moral character who shall volunteer their service and who may be acceptable to your department. Construction. It is proposed that national headquarters be established either in Washington or perhaps Chicago because of its geographical location and that branch organizations be established in such cities as your department may direct. Finances. It is proposed that headquarters organization and branch organizations shall finance themselves, either by outside subscriptions or by its members. Control. It is proposed that each unit of this organization shall be under the control of the government, but will report to and be under the direction of the nearest Department of Justice headquarters. End quote. Approval of the idea was given on March 20, 1917, and cities with high alien populations were targeted as organization centers for the APL. Notices went out the same day to bureau agents across the country announcing that Briggs was forming a volunteer committee or organization of citizens for the purpose of cooperating with the department in securing information of activities of agents of foreign governments or persons unfriendly to this government for the protection of public property, etc. The group would supply information upon request and at its own volition, was to operate in a confidential manner, and could exercise no arrest power except after consultation with the federal authorities, according to Belaski's notices. Quote, APL organizing activities proceeded with great speed and amazing secrecy in view of the method of recruiting and the numbers of individuals involved during the first war months. Not until September 1917 did minuscule newspaper notices acknowledge publicly the existence of the League. Justice Department requests to publishers for cooperation in retaining APL anonymity achieved results. In midsummer 1917, 
the league numbered 90,000 members organized in 600 locals. By war's end, 350,000 APL agents staffed 1,400 local units across the country. By January 1918, every federal attorney had an APL local at his disposal. From a free taxi service in Chicago, the APL developed swiftly into a nationwide apparatus. End quote. Footnote. Harold M. Hyman, To Try Men's Souls, Loyalty Tests in American History. Berkeley and Los Angeles, University of California Press, 1959, page 273. End footnote. With the National Office in Washington, League locals received instructions through state directors, who also functioned as internal inspectors general for the organizations and directly from headquarters. Out of the Capitol Command Post flowed circular instructions to locals, manuals of operation, assignments to investigations, and the League's weekly journal, The Spyglass. Funding appears to have been entirely private, deriving from contributions and membership fees. At the local level, organization followed a military pattern with ranks, badges, and sworn oaths of loyalty. Large factories and businesses with many League members in their employ became self-contained divisions with a pyramid-structured leadership. But while the APL was a mass membership group, recruitment was selective and class-conscious. Quote, With great acuity, the League directors searched among the upper social, economic, and political crust of each community for local chiefs and members. Bankers, businessmen, mayors, police chiefs, postmasters, ministers, attorneys, newspaper editors, officers of religious, charitable, fraternal, and patriotic societies, factory owners and foremen, YMCA workers and Chamber of Commerce leaders, insurance company executives, and teachers were favored sources of League personnel. Such men possessed means and leisure to devote to APL work and opened their professional, business, and official records for APL use. Many were also members of draft boards, war bond sale committees, food and fuel rationing units, and state defense councils, affording the League illicit access to information denied even to commissioned government investigators. End quote. The intelligence mission, which most often inspired leaguers to probe privileged files and otherwise private depositories of personal information, was its responsibility as primary loyalty investigator for the civil and military services. Quote, when the war started, no adequate mechanism existed for security clearances. The APL, with Gregory's permission, assumed this task. APL instruction manuals and special issues of the spyglass offered neophyte APL investigators advice on how to make character investigations. One such article suggested that the final success or failure of American arms would depend upon the quality of officer leadership. Every applicant for a military commission, every civil servant with more than clerical responsibilities, all welfare group officials who were to do overseas work, rated loyalty investigations. The APL newspaper warned leaguers that a loyalty inquiry implied no guilt and that unjustified innuendos of disloyalty might ruin a career and a life. A confidential APL manual warned that no two cases are exactly alike for the reason that no two men are exactly alike. The pamphlet advised all APL loyalty testers to examine a substantial cross-section of the subject's ancestors in enemy countries, his social, political, and church affiliations, his attitude toward the Lusitania sinking and the rape of Belgium, what he had said about war bonds, draft dodgers, and the Espionage Act. Had he purchased enough bonds, dug victory gardens, and appeared at patriotic rallies? Did neighbors recall untoward statements he might have made? Did he own stock in enemy-held corporations? Was his labor union respectable? But caution was the watchword in loyalty hunting, and the manual pleaded for objectivity and fullness in reporting. Officials would normally put full credence in the decision of the loyalty investigator. APL reports received almost complete acceptance in Washington. Thus, the APL agents became the judge, the jury, and sometimes the executioner in the lives of many 
who knew nothing of its existence. End quote. The League became active in other federal policy areas apart from loyalty investigation, including capturing suspicious immigrants, enforcing liquor and vice control around military cantonments, investigating the background of certain passport applicants, and probing the qualifications of persons applying for American citizenship. Aside from the Bureau of Investigation, the League's other great champion and supporter was Colonel Ralph Van Diemen and the Military Intelligence Division of the War Department. Van Diemen had sought League assistance shortly after it was established. Later, MID crushed efforts to create a competitor to the APL and directed that field personnel use only League assistance in civilian investigations. In the matter of policing war material production plants under strike, the League and military intelligence worked closely to control labor unrest. Eventually, both justice and war would sour on the zealous antics of the APL, trampling personnel sanctities, privacy, and civil liberties. Badges, which bore the legend Secret Service, for a time were flaunted as official authority to do about anything the bearers wanted to do. Treasury Secretary McAdoo protested that they gave the public the impression that their holders were agents from his department, a viewpoint which leaguers did little to discourage. APL raiders made arrests without proper authorization, and many carried firearms on their missions. In an effort to assist the Justice Department, some League locals even tapped and tampered with telegraph and telephone lines. Quote, even when APLers contented themselves with investigations, the result was wholesale abuse of civil liberties and invasions of privacy. An investigation typically began with a request forwarded from APL headquarters in Washington to the city chief, who assigned the case to one of his operatives. Once the operative received this request, he had numerous investigative weapons from which to choose. Membership in the APL provided each operative with an entree to the records of banks and other financial institutions, of real estate transactions, medical records, and, inevitably, legal records. Any material ordinarily considered confidential by private firms or corporations could be made available to operatives. Even institutions customarily regarded as repositories of confidence and trust compromised their standards. Bishop Theodore Henderson helped to spread the APL throughout the Methodist Church, with the result that Methodist ministers could often be approached for information about members of their congregations. Liaison was also established with Catholic, Jewish, and Protestant churches. The Maryland Casualty Company of Baltimore asked its agents throughout the country to join the League so that insurance information was readily available. Private detective agencies would check old records and disclose their contents. Anti-labor and nativistic groups opened their secret files to the APL. End quote. Official interest in the services of the APL waned with the arrival of Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer in the spring of 1919. The death knell sounded with the arrival of the Republicans two years later. Still, the old ties were not easily broken. Quote, as late as 1924, military intelligence officers were being instructed to maintain friendly relations with former APL members, as well as other counter-radical groups who might be called upon in time of trouble. Counter-espionage investigations had been discontinued, but questionnaires were being sent out to collect information on domestic affairs. A few men in the military intelligence realized that the MID's roving activities among the civilian population had given them an evil reputation that they must live down by scrupulously avoiding civilian investigations in the future. One book on military intelligence, published in 1924, alarmed some officers because it told how the Secret Service of the General Staff had operated far beyond military limits. But 1924 marked the end of anti-radical activity for both the War Department and the Justice Department. End quote. No agency of the federal government would ever again attempt to cultivate so ambitious and visible an intelligence auxiliary as the American Protective League. Footnote. Nevertheless, 
There are private intelligence organizations in existence today which, as part of an anti-communist program, maintain vast files on the political activities of their fellow Americans. Prominent among these groups are the American Security Council and the Church League of America. See Harold C. Ralea, Hawk's Nest, the American Security Council, The Nation, V. 214, January 24, 1972, 113 through 117. George Thayer, The Farther Shores of Politics. New York, Simon & Schuster, 1967, pages 256 through 262. Wallace Turner, Anti-Communist Council Prepares a Voting Index on Congress. New York Times, August 17, 1970. William W. Turner, Power on the Right. Berkeley, Ramparts Press, 1971, pages 134 through 140, 199 through 215. End footnote. This is Our Hidden History.